Gracious God, thank you. Thank you that it is your presence here that gives our time together its power, its grace, and its beauty. So, O Lord, allow us as we gather together in your name to drink deeply of your presence and so be refreshed. For we do say in words, sacrament, song, prayer, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Scott, you've been called to actually a pretty precarious place. I want to share, if I may, um, what not to do. And I'm talking about an attitude on the inside, as well as a different way to think about it that is more in line with what the Scripture teaches. Oh, gosh. That's new. <laughs> a long time ago when I was in college, I was praying with a friend of mine. No, actually, no, it was in seminary. And my friend was prone to getting divine revelations, some of which could be very concert, disconcerting because they were so accurate. You know, there's some things you don't want other people to know, much less for God to tell them about you. And that's exactly our situation. We're just having a conversation, as seminary people do late in the night, talking together, bantering about ideas, things we were wrestling with in the classroom. And I was no different, and I loved that. It was a great environment, to be honest with you. And this one particular friend of mine, and I took some time to pray after it was all over, and Ralph was his name. And he said to me, you know, Greg, when I think about you, here's what comes to mind. It's as if you're on a tightrope. And this is where life started. This is where life ends, and you're kind of over in here. And it's, it's a high wire tightrope. It's like the circus. Everybody's like way down there. And you have a balanced beam. There's a net underneath you. If you fall, you will not die. He said, that's grace. But you really do see the Christian life as precariously with all your might trying to get from one point to the other successfully. And everything inside of me said both that's true and also I wish that wasn't true. And I really began to pray because I realized at that moment that what had happened was unbeknownst to me, quite honestly, because I could quote all, quote all the Scripture in the world about how we are saved by grace through faith, um, that there really was inside of me a force that was demanding perfection in a way that did not look like the gospel at all. The high demand position that you are in will sometimes speak that voice to you, that you have to hold it together you have to pay attention to everything that comes your way. Keep it all in balance. Respond to everyone in a timely and thoughtful manner, as opposed to what you might want to say when you get a certain email or telephone call. It's already happened, by the way. But what I would want to say to you is, is that the more precarious you allow the position to, in essence, make you feel, the more out of kilter in your own heart you will become and put you in a very, very different position from to me, what to me are actually the two pillars of the gospel reading. One is, you did not choose me, I chose you. And then the other is, abide in my love. Because honestly, the last thing a guy on a high wire is thinking about is abiding in God's love. He's just trying to get through the day. 
but it is a temptation. And the reason it's a temptation is because you, in essence, as I have tried to think about your position, have the responsibility to speak as one on the inside of sort of church life and also on the outside, especially as a diocesan staff member. You see, to speak as one on the inside means to be able to turn to your fellow clergy and say to your sisters and brothers, I'm a priest. I know what this is like. There is a kind of insider communication that happens because, as I said in the earlier part of the charge, they know you've been in the trenches, which gives them and should give them the freedom to be able to speak openly with you and not be afraid that somehow they are going to be, they are going to be judged and found wanting because the real thing that you and I expect is somebody be doing this on the high wire and working really hard at it. You are one who knows, as a result, the joys and the trials of what it means to serve as a member of the clergy in our church. And it's both. You know the joys of seeing people changed by the power of the gospel. We get to be, as it were, on the inside with people in some of the most tender and precious moments that all of life ever presents. It is, at its heart of heart, an extraordinary privilege. And you also get to be in those points where people are acting so childish, so divisive, so power-hungry, that just to step into the fray means you're going to be the, get the brunt of all of that anger and rage, and you become in some ways the personification of everything they don't like about God and about their life. You are a kind of walking target. It's, it's no coincidence that Scott came into the office one day, and I have a whole bunch of books outside of my office, and they're things that have been sent to me or I haven't filed yet. Or so. And what book did he pull out? It's a book entitled, When Sheep Attack. <laughs> and he proceeded to give me a three-page, single-spaced summary of the things that he had read in that book. And his response was, wow. Yeah, it really does happen. All of that is, in essence, insider knowledge. And a part of what you bring to the table in this role as canon. As I said, no member of the clergy could ever come and say to you, you don't know what it's like, because you do. And that, for me, is one of the strongest assets of what it is that you bring to this position. But you also speak on from the outside, meaning someone who is not a part of that congregational system, except in a more tangential way, as canon to the ordinary coming from the Diocese of Central Florida into the life of a local church, because very, very few congregations in the Diocese of Central Florida think of themselves as centrally part of the diocesan mission, ancillary at best, but not organically tied together in a way that has actually a genuine impact on what's happening in the local congregation. So, you can, but that's an asset in a strange sort of way, because that allows you to come in and help a congregation or a member of the clergy see what they cannot see, because they're stewing in their own juices. They're a part of the mix of what's in the pot. And believe me, if you're making some kind of stew, Scott's a cook. The chicken inside the pot is not going to say up, lean up and say, we need more garlic in here. You have to taste the sauce and determine as an outsider to what's going on in the stew, what the stew needs or the better way to prepare it. You are the reminder as a result uh, to local congregations and the clergy. Sometimes this is good news to them, sometimes it's not so good news that they are not entities to themselves, that they are a part of what is described as the goodly fellowship of the Diocese of Central Florida, the Episcopal Church, and the wider Anglican Communion. 
and that each of our congregations has within this global context a common mission. And that all of us in each of our communities bear a responsibility first and foremost to be that salt and light that does its best to reach each region and parish with the gospel, with, to be in that community, people who in essence speak up in the name of Jesus Christ. You are the reminder that this goodly fellowship has about it a common mission, but also, and this is what some people don't want to know, a common obligation in carrying out that mission to live our lives according to diocesan canons, to live out the common discipline of prayer book worship, local as well as international missionary partnerships, where necessary, when necessary clergy or congregational discipline, and in providing both the assistance and the leadership in the calling of new clergy to serve in that local congregation. Because if you're talking about people who serve as priests in charge, whether that be rector or vicar or somewhere in between, the bishop and diocese has to say yes, as well as the candidate and the local vestry or calling committee. And finally, to do all of these tasks is my representative in a way that allows bishop, canons, and congregation, God being our helper, to move in step with each other. That's enormous, especially given 80-some congregations, new church plants and others arising in the ever-changing landscape. We are not a stable environment. We are an emerging environment. The stew in the pot bubbles, and it should. Otherwise, it would be just yesterday's leftovers. And God help us if that's the best we've got. So the vitality of the ever-changing environment actually is the opportunity for you and others to step in and to be able to bring into that stew all that is necessary, that it feeds many, not just the cook staff in the parish hall. But how can you do that unless you know that you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last? There will be times when you will sing with joy because God is pouring into you all that you need to be able to genuinely make a difference in a time of genuine difficulty. And there are other times when you will be in your car when if you had the capacity to do so and keep both hands on the wheel, you'd be going, God, why did you put me in this mess to begin with? It was your idea, it wasn't mine. And that's true. <laughs> it's God's idea. Henry Nouwen, in a phenomenal book that still stands up for me, called In the Name of Jesus, tells the story of moving from the faculty of Harvard University to live among the mentally challenged people of La Arche community in Toronto. He quickly realized that all of his successes were, in some ways, irrelevant to that group of people. He said, I realized that none of the books I had written impressed anyone because they didn't know how to read them. I realized that my years at Notre Dame, Harvard, Yale meant nothing because they'd never been to college. And my ecumenical experience meant nothing. When I was sitting at dinner, he said, I offered some meat to one of the assistants at the dinner table, and one of the residents spoke up and said, oh, don't give him any meat. He doesn't eat meat. He's Presbyterian. <laughs> he said, this experience was in some ways, and still is, the most important experience of my life because it forced me to rediscover my true identity. And stepping into a new position should, if it does anything, is shake you out of living in your precedence, as helpful as they can be from time to time. And again, to be in a new way, literally stand naked before God and say, all I've got is you and still step forward, and to step forward courageously. 
Now one writes these words. He said, the only way one can live this life is a life anchored in the knowledge of God's first love and to be by his mercy a person whose identity is deeply rooted in this first love. If there is any focus that the Christian leader will need, it is the discipline of dwelling in the presence of the one who continues to ask, do you love me? Do you love me? me? Do you love me? It is this that actually fuels the discipline of prayer. It is through prayer we keep ourselves from being pulled from one urgent issue to another, from becoming strangers to our own heart because of the demands that are surround us, as well as being strangers to the heart of God. It is prayer that keeps us home, rooted, and safe even when we are on the road moving from one place to another, as you will do quite a lot. Even then surrounded through our phones, I add, not him, this was 1989, but rooted even on the road, moving from place to place, surrounded by sounds of argument and violence. It is not enough for priests and ministers to be moral people, well-trained, eager to help their fellow humans, able to respond creatively to the burning issues of their time. All of that is valuable and important, but it is not the heart of Christian leadership. The central question of leadership is, are the leaders truly men and women of God, people with an ardent desire to dwell in God's presence, to listen to God's voice, to look at God's beauty, to touch God's incarnate word, and to taste fully God's infinite goodness. That, it seems to me, what it me is what it means to live out the second pillar of the gospel reading, which is abide in my love. You have to know that you're there by divine appointment, otherwise, you'll have no courage whatsoever, and you'll just try to make the best of a difficult situation. But more importantly, to live in that precarious place where you are called upon to be a man of courage and humility simultaneously, not one versus the other, can only happen when your heart is rooted in the kind of love that only can come from God, and that no matter what happens in terms of the consequences of the things that you say and do. You are still secure in a place that God provides for you because He never promises success. He does promise the gift of faithfulness. And it is that that you need to do this above all else. So whether you need to put these on the bathroom mirror or tape them with a sticky note to your dashboard, you did not choose me, I chose you. Abide in my love. It will be the ground beneath your feet and provide for you, even in the worst of circumstances, the courage to continue to laugh, sing, speak with compassion, and keep baking cookies. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>